In a speech to the Atlantic Council think tank, Brett Neiman, the Deputy Undersecretary for International Finance of the U.S. Treasury, emphasized that the budget assistance provided by the U.S. and its allies to Ukraine is aimed at combating corruption and increasing transparency, especially as Ukraine seeks to join NATO. Neiman highlighted that Ukraine's economy has shown resilience during the ongoing conflict, but stressed the need for reforms to minimize the risk of corruption and conflicts of interest. He outlined several anti-corruption measures already undertaken by Ukraine, such as requiring public office holders to report their asset holdings, shielding the Special Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office from political influence and enhancing corporate governance in state-owned enterprises. The U.S. has reportedly provided around $175 billion to Ukraine, according to the Council on Foreign Relations, and both the European Union and NATO have demanded extensive anti-corruption efforts before Kiev can join their ranks. Neiman asserted that while defending Ukraine against Russia's attacks is a priority, the support from the international community also presents an opportunity to drive necessary reforms within Ukraine. He pointed out that budget assistance from the US, Europe, and international financial institutions is specifically designed to support these critical reforms. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, elected in 2019 on an anti-corruption platform, has taken steps to reinforce his commitment to this cause, including the dismissal of top officials such as Ivan Bakhanov, the former head of the state security service, in July 2022. Over the past two years, Ukraine has seen several high-profile dismissals, including its defense minister, top prosecutor and intelligence chief, as part of these anti-corruption efforts. In a separate but related context, a Russian court has rejected an appeal by sociologist and activist Boris Kagerlitsky against his five-year prison sentence for justifying terrorism. Kagerlitsky, a longtime political dissident who has openly criticized the conflict in Ukraine, faced these charges for comments made in a video about a Ukrainian attack on the bridge linking Russia to annex Crimea. The video, titled Explosive Congratulations for Mostik the Cat, referred to a cat living on the Crimean Bridge, used by state media to symbolize Crimea's connection to Russia. Initially fined 600,000 rubles, Kagulitsky's sentence was later increased to a prison term following a prosecution appeal for a harsher punishment. Meanwhile, an investigation has revealed that the Russian Orthodox Church is involved in Russifying Ukrainian children abducted by occupying forces. The report by Doxa, a Russian opposition student journal and open-source outlet Kitmapping, found that children from orphanages and boarding schools in the occupied Donetsk region were taken to Russia's Rostov region. Their senior clergy, including Metropolitan Mercury, encouraged these children to undergo baptism into the Russian Orthodox Church (ROC) and participate in military patriotic youth organizations, severing their Ukrainian identities. The ROC's role in implementing the Kremlin's occupation plans has been highlighted, and Maria Vova Belova, the Kremlin's commissioner on children's rights, is implicated in these deportations, with an ICC arrest warrant issued against her. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has warned that Moscow is ready to target French military instructors allegedly operating in Ukraine, considering them legitimate targets regardless of their official status. This follows a statement from Ukrainian commander Oleksandr Sersky about French instructors soon visiting Ukrainian training centers. Kremlin spokesperson Vitry Peskov echoed Lavrov's remarks, indicating that anyone training Ukrainian troops would not be immune from Russian attacks. But before we continue, if you're enjoying this briefing, please kindly support this channel by liking and clicking on the subscribe button below to subscribe to this channel and to help YouTube learn of your preferences and enable you receive new video updates every time they are uploaded. Thank you. Let's get going. In another development, a Swiss-hosted summit on Ukraine aims to lay groundwork for future talks involving Russian officials focusing on nuclear safety, food security, and the return of abducted children. Scheduled for June 15 to 16, the summit will attempt to build trust among various international leaders, though Russian officials will not attend this initial meeting. Organizers have streamlined Ukraine's 10-point plan to encourage broader participation, emphasizing principles such as safety of nuclear facilities, free navigation for food security, and the release of war captives. U.S. President Joe Biden is set to meet Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky during his visit to Europe for D-Day celebrations in Normandy and the G7 summit in Italy. Discussions will likely include the potential use of $300 billion in frozen Russian assets to aid Ukraine's war effort, contingent on the EU extending sanctions against Russia. This meeting follows their last encounter in Washington, D.C. December 2023, where Zelensky sought further military and economic aid from the U.S. Biden's efforts to support Ukraine have faced delays due to opposition in Congress, particularly as the 2024 election approaches.
Ukraine's military reported successfully downing 22 out of 27 Russian drones launched overnight, intercepting them over several regions including Mykolaiv, Kherson, Dnipro, Sumy, and Poltava. This defensive success highlights the ongoing intense conflict, particularly in areas like Donetsk, which Russia illegally annexed early in the war following Shane referendums. The ongoing war has also influenced corporate strategies, with Russia's two largest banks, Spurbank and VTB planning to open branches in the annexed regions of Ukraine. Spurbank CEO, German Graf, announced that the bank aims to have a presence across the entirety of these regions, while VTB CEO Andrei Kostin detailed plans for new offices in Luhansk and intentions to expand into Donetsk and Mariupol by the end of the year. These moves underscore Russia's efforts to solidify its control over the annexed territories. In the economic arena, U.S. Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally of the Yemu stressed the need for American companies to improve compliance with Russia-related sanctions. He urged manufacturers, particularly those of microelectronics and machine tools, to ensure their supply chains do not contribute to Russia's evasion of sanctions. Adeyemo also highlighted the importance of vigilance among freight forwarders, distributors, and financial institutions to prevent Moscow from circumventing these economic measures. Polish farmers have resumed their blockade at the Ukrainian border, protesting agricultural imports from Ukraine, which they claim create unfair competition. The demonstrations, ongoing since last autumn, have strained relations between Warsaw and Kiev. Poland, a major agricultural producer, banned imports of several Ukrainian products in 2023 and the current protests continue to reflect the farmers' discontent with the impact of Ukrainian imports on their market. In terms of cybersecurity, Microsoft has accused Russia of targeting the upcoming Paris Olympics with a disinformation campaign, which Moscow has dismissed as absolute slander. Russian disinformation tactics, described as sophisticated and plausibly deniable, have previously targeted elections and public opinion in the U.S., Europe and Britain. Colonel Simon Diggins, a former British defense attaché, suggested that Russia's attacks on France are partly motivated by sour grapes over being barred from the Olympics and France's support for Ukraine's use of its missiles against Russian targets. Finally, the death of Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny continues to provoke international outrage. Navalny's supporters and family marked what would have been his 48th birthday with a memorial service at his grave, amidst calls for further sanctions against Vladimir Putin's inner circle. Navalny, convicted on multiple charges and serving over 30 years in prison, died in February at an Arctic prison colony under circumstances his family claims are suspicious and likely linked to the Russian government. The Kremlin denies involvement, citing natural causes as the official reason for his death. His anti-corruption foundation, now operating in exile, continues to challenge the Russian government's actions. As these events unfold, the global community remains closely attentive to the dynamic and evolving situation in Ukraine and Russia, with significant implications for international relations, security, and economic policies. The international response to these developments continues to shake the broader geopolitical landscape, highlighting the enduring complexity and gravity of the conflict and its far-reaching effects. That's where we wrap things up for the time being. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.